I've used this 42 keyboard for a couple of months now to see how it compares to keyboards like the Glove 80 and the Advantage 360, keyboards with nearly double the number of keys. I'd long held the belief that I couldn't sensibly get by with less than about 55 keys, but I'd never actually put that theory to the test. Well, this is that test. If you are new to the channel, I try and record the odd video that isn't something to do with keyboards, but unfortunately, I failed again this time. But if you enjoy this, give it a like, because it really does help other people find my extremely nerdy content. To be successful with a keyboard, with this few keys, you're going to need a keyboard that at least supports multiple layers. Now, if you're a bona fide keyboard nerd, you can skip this bit. For you other two that are still watching this, here's what you need to know. When you start looking at programmable keyboards, it's not long until you come across the notion of layers. And that's the ability to have the keys on your keyboard do different things than their standard layout in different situations. Layers mean you can have less physical keys because each key can do more than just one job. Don't think too hard about this. Layers are conceptually just the same as pressing shift on the one of your keyboard, and if you're in the UK or the US, you would get an exclamation mark on your screen. Layers just provide the ability to have more than one modifier, like a shift key, um, at your disposable to do a greater number of alternative things on each key. So for example, these keys are standard alpha keys, but if I hold down a key on the other side, my layer one modifier, and this actually becomes an e-pad, so uh, a number pad, so I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, etc. So that is layers, something a standard keyboard does not allow for, aside from the aforementioned shift key. I'll talk more about the layers that I'm using with this Cornish Zen shortly. All that is important to appreciate at this point is that the layering capability makes possible a continuum. And at one end of the continuum, you can have a keyboard with very few physical keys and many, many layers to accommodate every character that you might need to type. And at the other end of the continuum would be a keyboard with every conceivable key in physical form with no layers at all. So effectively, at either end of this continuum, it's kind of choose your poison time. You can either have lots of keys, which is a physical burden, or lots of layers, which is a cognitive burden. Whenever I've tried to use considerably less keys in the past, I just didn't enjoy it. I felt I was constantly tying my fingers up, trying to do something that was just a single press on my normal keyboard. But, like some weird cult, the three key keyboard brigade sucked me into their ideology and I decided I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. And so to do that properly, I needed to go native. So I decided I would spend 30 days with a 42 key version of the Korn, one of the most popular small split keyboards. I was gonna build one, but as chance would have it, I was lucky enough to snag one of the last Cornish Zens. As a brief aside, I love this keyboard. It's got a fantastic design, it's hot swap, so fickle people like me can change switches easily. It's got chopped space keys here rather than MX space keys, so it makes it super compact. And it even has these little e-ink screens. It's just a wonderful, wonderful piece of kit. But this is not supposed to be a review. If you could still buy one of these, which you can't, I would heartily recommend it. But as you can't, let's move on. You'll just have to be smug like me if you've got one and jealous if you're not. And you know, I'm sorry about that. But for now, back to the challenge. So, day one with a small board with only 42 keys was pretty rough for me. Some things in Vim, for example, seemed immediately worse. Things like the dollar sign or the hat sign to move to the end and the beginning of lines was considerably more mentally taxing. Instead of just holding down the four or the six key in for a little bit longer, like I do on my other keyboards that have got auto shift, I had to do the dance of holding the key on the right while I used the number pad I'd set on the nav layer on the left. So things like 22G as well to go to line 22 or a square bracket S to go to a previous spelling error, they were surprisingly taxing with this keyboard. Each required a separate layer to do something which I'd long ago stopped even thinking about. The thing that made the challenge at least viable for me was another feature only made possible with a programmable keyboard and that is home row mods. Now before I went the small board route, I'd never really given home row mods a fair crack. I've mentioned home row mods now in plenty of other videos, but in case the concept is alien to you, it's where you have your modifier key doubling up on the home row uh, on each hand when you hold the key in. So, for example, on this keyboard here, uh, I have hyper, uh, shift, command, alt, and control, and that's mirrored on the other side as well. I just don't think I could get by on a small board like this without home row mods. Now, the home row mod setup I use for this board I got from you, Rob, and it works 
very well indeed. I'm getting virtually no problems in use and having a shift key right under my index finger means I don't miss auto shift quite as much as I thought I would, which is what I'd got used to on my other boards. I really recommend Nick Kustos's editor to set this up and I have a video elsewhere on this channel that goes into detail on doing just that. If you want to go and have a read about UROB's Home Row mods, there's a link in the description. The layout I used throughout this experiment remained largely unchanged throughout, so let me talk a little bit about that. I have a base Colmac DHM layer, where enter is the big thumb on the right, space is the big thumb on the left. I'm doubling up on those keys so that if I hold them, they go to my first layer. And my second layer is also selectable from one of the other thumb keys um, on either side. I've called layer one on my nav layer, but it's actually almost everything else that I use regularly. So arrows and brackets, page up and down keys. Um, on the right, I've got a num number pad and calculator symbols on the left. And then I've got a system layer with my function keys, F1, F2, etc. I've got the media controls, Bluetooth connections, and a shortcut to get into bootloader mode on the keyboard. And my final layer is just for positioning Windows in Mac OS. I've shown the system I use to tell my Windows and switch applications elsewhere on this channel, so check that out too in the other videos if you're interested. It's just a super efficient way to switch applications and Windows in Mac OS, which is otherwise a bit pants in that regard. Another firmware feature I used for the first time when I tried this small keyboard is combos. And with combos in ZMK, you press two or more keys in unison to send a particular key to the OS. So I find the two keys above and below my index fingers on the home row for minus and underscore, very intuitive, for example. I also have the two inner home row keys for an equals and the two bottom corner keys to put my machine to sleep. The top inner keys give me caps word, which is kind of like caps lock, except it toggles itself off when you press space. Regardless of all these new inventive features of programmable keyboards, I did find the first day quite tiring on this small board, especially on the forearms. I'm not really sure why that was, whether I'd just become so accustomed to the key wells of the other boards, or I was actually holding my wrists a bit differently, maybe because of anticipating different layers and such. But yeah, I could feel it a little bit on the first days. The second day involved a lot of work in the design program sketch. Now, Less keys in a design program is generally fine, although I did realise that almost all the problems I was encountering were just muscle memory issues. This was day two, and you don't actually know what half the shortcuts you use day to day are. You think you do, but you likely just know what the shape is that you're making with your keys when you press them. And I found myself having to think consciously about how I hold my keys to do that shortcut on the other boards that I'm used to, and then translate that into the layer that I was using on this small board. Not unbearable, but it certainly slowed things down quite a bit. By day three, I was starting to feel like I was going backwards. I suspect my flea-sized mind had already got bored of the challenge, and I no longer wanted to go the extra mile to achieve things that were ordinarily second nature on other boards. However, it was on day three when I rested my hands on the Advantage 360 that was also on my desk at the time, and thought now just how comically big it seemed. I'm not really sure what that meant, but it felt like I was a kid trying on my mum's shoes again. We all did that right. I mean, come on, don't act like you didn't do that. After 10 or so days with the board, I started to really wonder if the characters I'd taken the time to put in the easiest spots were actually the characters I should have put in the easiest spots. To answer that question, I thought I'd make a very crude bit of code to just do some kind of text analysis on the kind of files that I'm usually working with. So to provide that insight, I thought it'd be interesting to test which characters I type the most, aside from the standard alphanumeric ones. Specifically, I was interested in things like equals, dash, underscore, double quote, single quote, slashes. So I created this little rudimentary uh, string analyzer, and I'll, I'll put a link down in the note. Be warned, it's very rudimentary, but it allowed me to paste in the contents of three typical files that I would work on. So one was a CSS file, one was a TypeScript file, the other was a markdown file. So across those files, minus was the most used, which was 317 instances, double quote was 280, and equals was 258. Now obviously this is just one personal data point using three random files, but it did at least make me fairly confident that my suspicions were largely correct, and I had the most frequently used characters as accessible as possible on this small keyboard. Around halfway through the 30-day experiment window, I started to feel that the muscle memory was pretty much there. And I was also ready to concede at this point that with a bit more practice, you could be just as productive with a small board as you could with a board with many more physical keys. It's all just muscle memory. Comfort also felt very good at this point. The pains I'd suffered initially had gone, and it also, I think, helped that this Cornish Zen is so low to the desk. But even putting that aside, with fewer keys, they're just 
there are less finger stretches to do. And thanks to the split in the home row mods, the cording that you need to do day to day is typically a combination of both hands rather than mixing all the fingers of one hand up at once. So for example, when I wanted to move along terminal windows or tabs in the browser, I needed to press option, command and arrows. To make that easier, I have keys for that in the nav layer. And when I want to bring up something like say, a command palette in something like Sublime Text, it's shift and command on the right hand side and a P on the left. And that combination of uh, different fingers on different hands feels very civilized. But here's the big question. Was I actually more productive at this point? And the truth is, I don't think I was. I think enough keys or enough layers is equally viable. At the halfway point, I was thinking it was certainly just as comfortable as a board with many more layers. Even though you're usually pressing more keys at once for the same result, it gets offset by the fact that those extra keys are that you know that you need to press because you're using a layer they're typically either under or very close to your home row even though you're needing to switch layers and that makes it fairly comfortable even if a, li a little bit more uh, mentally difficult and i definitely felt that at a halfway point having a number pad on a layer is definitely a win regardless and something i should have done a long time ago on my other programmable boards as i came to the end of the month one thing i wasn't expecting that really stood out was just how comfortable this board is for me when writing something like prose. If I just wrote for a living, I think this would probably be the most comfortable board to type on that I have. Perhaps it's the lowness, um, the tightness of the chalk spaced switches uh, on this chalk corn, perhaps the sunset switches that I'm using or the L DSA keycaps. Perhaps it's just the sum of all these things. Everything feels just in reach when you're just writing prose with fewer keys. There's just simply less choices. So your fingers are never more than one key of travel from what you need to press. So in that regard, it helps with accuracy and I'm not very good in terms of accuracy when typing. And it's odd that when I subsequently added a number pad to something like the 360 or the Glove 80, I found it isn't quite as effective. I occasionally get lost in the midst of all the extra keys. The problem is I don't just write prose and this is for me where after some time, things started to come a little bit undone. It's not all good news in keyboard minimalism. The thing I really struggled with was a lack of dedicated arrow keys. I work in design software a lot as well as code. It's just something in those domains I really appreciate dedicated arrow keys for. Now the frustration definitely waned over time and I could certainly get used to it from a mental burden point of view but I think if I could have extra keys just for that purpose when I need them and use them so much I probably should. I also started to develop thumb pain uh, or rather thumb tiredness every day on the left hand side after the 30 days, and I put that down to needing to hold in um, that thumb key to access my navigation layer with the, the keys on over on the right. Now, of course, instead of holding a key down to swap the layers, I could have a key to toggle the layer on and another to toggle it off, but then what's the point? If I need arrow keys all the time, why not just have arrow keys all the time physically? Insisting on less keys in the face of obvious advantages to having more keys is cutting off my nose to spite my face. And these factors are very frustrating for me because I love this 42 keyboard and the similar ZSA Voyager an awful lot. But after extended periods with either of them, I do suffer some discomfort in my thumbs as there's nowhere decent to put the dedicated arrow keys um, that my working life just simply demands. As I got past a month using 42 keys, I was really looking forward to getting back onto one of my normal size keyboards. I thought I'd really appreciate it. However, the reality is, the more muscle memory you build up on one of the slightly different boards, the more you lose it on another. So subsequently, I found myself more and more, after the initial period of this experiment, pushing the larger boards away and pulling this corn back out of my backpack. It's been a granular transition back over many months to where I now mostly type on something like the 360, the Glove 80, or a more conventional um, board like the Boardwalk or the Promenade. But I do relish a spell where I know I won't be writing code or using design software because I can switch to one of the small boards with fewer keys and really appreciate it. So whether you prefer extra keys or extra layers, I don't think one is categorically better than the other. You can get by with either and your brain will figure out the layering on a small board, I'm convinced of that. You can definitely be equally productive with less keys, but it does require adopting some of the newer features of programmable keyboards. I would not like to have done that without those. Plus, there's always gonna be the odd thing which relies on something that your oh-so-clever little keyboard invalidates. Just to give you one example, I use uh, the design software Sketch, and in that you can press and hold the space bar and that lets you drag the canvas around. On this board, I can't press and hold the space because I have to have it as the, the layer change for the nav layer. Now, I could introduce a tap buttons function there to solve that problem, or I could just use a more sensibly sized keyboard where I don't have to be quite so clever. 
more keys or more layers. Ultimately, like so many of these divisive questions, there just isn't a clear answer. I enjoy these small boards and it's possible for some people to be just as productive with them, but they are not the end game for me. Having a dedicated arrow cluster is just too useful for my working life. But for some people, I'll certainly concede that less might be more. See you again sometime.